Stalking bad guys undetected, gravity-defying parkour escapes, taking out targets with a hidden blade. The wildly successful Assassin's Creed video game franchise has everything a gamer expects from a 21st century open-world action-adventure. Plus, all that super cool butt-kicking takes place in meticulously researched and painstakingly recreated places from the past. From colonial America to ancient Greece, the stories of Assassin's Creed are set among the cities, landmarks, geography, and architecture of the historical world. But they don't stop there. Created by Patrice Desilet, Jade Raymond, and Corey May, Assassin's Creed fills those ancient places with in-game characters going about their daily lives, complete with historically accurate perspectives, goals, and concerns about politics, society, and economics. And it's that extra step of historical fidelity populating the game with the culture of the time that makes Assassin's Creed so unique among major video game releases. Since we experience historical pop culture through modern eyes, our reaction to those lives and details can tell us as much about how we live and think today as it does about the past. And sometimes, the keys to unlocking the truth of our own cultural moment are the details that the creators of that pop culture choose to alter about the past. Assassin's Creed grew out of another popular, historically set video game franchise, the Prince of Persia series. Those games, much like the Assassin's Creed, feature an acrobatic hero leaping around the ancient world battling bad guys. But they often portrayed Persia some 2,300 years ago as a kind of generically exotic locale, rather than a once real place that was actually inhabited by flesh and blood human beings. To set their new game apart, the Assassin's Creed designers began to investigate the actual history of their game's settings, beginning with the Middle East of 1191 and eventually moving through Renaissance-era Italy and the French Revolution to Victorian London and colonial America. The design team grew to include a staff of full-time historians. Scholars led extensive site visits around the world, and designers spent thousands of hours studying specific locations, eras, and historical peoples. The goal, according to the game's designers, was to make the entire experience more immersive. As Assassin's Creed scriptwriter Corey may put it, we want our games to be as true to life as possible. If you, the player, can hop online or even better crack open a book and realize that what you're seeing in-game mirrors what happened, then the credibility of our universe and your immersion in it is increased. Assassin's Creed took all this to a new level when developing 2017's Assassin's Creed Origins, set at a very specific and fascinating turning point in ancient Egyptian history. The year was 49 BCE, and Cleopatra ruled Egypt. The thing is, Cleopatra wasn't Egyptian. She was actually the last in a long line of Greek rulers, stretching all the way back to Alexander the Great. Egypt hadn't been governed by a native Egyptian for generations, something most contemporary cultural depictions of ancient Egypt neglect to mention. The pharaohs we think of as ruling the Nile River Valley had been gone for centuries. Heck, the Great Pyramid was already two and a half thousand years old by the time Cleopatra was born. By setting a video game at this specific time in history alone, the designers are challenging some common Western assumptions about ancient Egypt. But the game goes much further, digging into how all all those years under foreign occupation might have shaped the perspectives of the native Egyptians who actually lived in Cleopatra's time. Since the time of the pharaohs, Egypt had been occupied by many different peoples, from Nubians, Assyrians, and Persians to the Greeks under Alexander the Great. When Alexander died in 323 BCE, his general Ptolemy took over the region, starting a dynasty that would last almost 300 years, all the way to Cleopatra herself. So the story of Egypt at the time of Assassin's Creed Origins is one of generations of cultural imperialism, as all sorts of African and Mediterranean cultures have exerted dominance over the native Egyptians. And now the Romans are coming. All that history is not only faithfully reconstructed by the game, but it's also central to the game's main storyline and its hero, a native Egyptian named Bayek. Bayek chafes under Greek rule and fights against injustices both big and small being committed against his fellow native Egyptians. Historically speaking, this was a time of intense and complex cultural conflict, as one occupying culture, embodied by the Greeks, was giving way to another, brought in by the Romans, while the indigenous Egyptian population is fighting for survival 
survival and independence. The game designers have gone even further by tying the landscapes and architecture of the game to this cultural context. For example, Alexandria, then the capital of Egypt, didn't even exist before the Greeks arrived. It was founded by Alexander the Great, who very humbly named it after himself. In the game, the culture of the city is heavily influenced by Greek culture. There are Greek pantheons, Greek theaters, and the famous Alexandria Library. The characters' costumes, preoccupations, and perspectives all align with the Greek ruling class. Native Egyptians are portrayed as second-class citizens, living in slums, speaking their own language, and chafing under Greek rule. By making the player character Bayek part of this group, the game puts players in the perspective of a once powerful people who have been systematically conquered and ruled over for centuries. The story is ultimately centering a colonized people, which is a pretty bold move for a blockbuster video game that itself aspires cultural dominance. Downriver, the game accurately depicts Egypt much as it had looked for millennia before. Farmers irrigate crops along the Nile, people worship native gods, speak native Egyptian languages, and Bayek is more free to defy the soldiers of the ruling Greeks, smashing statues and saving fellow Egyptians. When the game takes you to the Libyan city of Cyrene, the landscape and people change again. This was a place the Egyptians surrendered to the Romans in 96 BCE in both real life and the game, and the city shows the effects of that transformation. The echoes of Egyptian architecture and culture are still present, but only underneath all the Roman trappings of villas, gladiator rings, and chariot races. And that level of detail and attention to how history was lived creates an entirely different cultural effect on the people playing the game today. Vice contributor Amr al Asr echoes many Egyptian American critics when they note that seeing how regular people lived during this era helps work against the stereotypes that make up so much of Egyptian pop culture in the West. Specifically, the way that Western cultural depictions present the West as a tradition of progress and civility, while the East traffics in spirituality, mysticism, and old traditions. Not to mention the way that the cultures of the Orient become interchangeable. Assassin's Creed Origins also revealed stereotypes that some modern gamers have about ancient Egypt. A small but vocal group of gamers objected to the depiction of Bayek as a dark-skinned character. Their assumptions about ancient Egyptian skin tone like likely came from Western pop cultural depictions, which often feature fair-skinned actors playing pharaohs and servants alike. In fact, many hieroglyphic depictions of ancient native Egyptians portray them with varying degrees of dark skin. It also misses a central point of the game, that Egypt in Cleopatra's day was a big old mix of cultures from all over Africa and the Mediterranean that had been living together for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Any way you look at it, the game designers worked very hard to ground Assassin's Creed origins in as much historical detail as they could. And in doing so, they taught us a lot about ancient Egypt. But maybe by examining the details they deliberately changed, we can learn something about who we are today. After going out of their way to set this version of the game at a very specific historical, political, and cultural moment, the designers decided to portray their main character as a Magi. Now the Magi were an ancient order of native Egyptian warriors who served the ancient pharaohs pharaohs that the game had already told us haven't been around for a long, long time. In fact, by the time Cleopatra came to power, the Magi had been gone for more than a thousand years. For a game as preoccupied with historical accuracy, that's a big change. Perhaps it's just a way of indulging in some video game shorthand. Make this guy a warrior! Look at his cool moves! Watch him swing that sword! And it also ties in with the overarching story that links all the Assassin's Creed games. That long-forgotten secret warrior society societies have been fighting for the fate of humanity all this time. But maybe it also highlights the fact that in 2017, in order to center a blockbuster video game aimed at a mainstream audience around an ancient and oppressed people who actually lived, you needed to make the main character a legit badass. Better yet, make him the descendant of a long dead order of badasses, who also sees visions of native Egyptian gods and can mind meld with his eagle to scope out bad guys. Ooh, and don't forget his cool little wrist knife and his ability to scale vertical stone walls. The point is, for all its historical accuracy and cultural sensitivity, a franchise as successful as Assassin's Creed still has to hedge its bets and bend history to meet the demands of a contemporary gaming audience. Which doesn't diminish the work the game designers did to investigate and recreate such a specific historical period. It only illustrates another way we can use historical pop culture to shed a little more light onto who we are today.